Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. Bismillah walhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Uh, so we're on chapter 9 of the Book of Assistance, if people want to pull it up. So this chapter is on reflection, on fiqh. And we've been going through it over the last few weeks, looking at the different things that Imam al-Haddad, rahmullah, gives counsel on actually reflecting upon. Right? And it goes in kind of an order as well that we can benefit from if we were to do it in that way. Um, has anybody taken time to actually engage in this reflection? Or in any of these things? You have? Yeah. yeah how's it been? You're so smiley as you say this. <laughs> it's really, really interesting. Yeah. But yeah, please tell us. What's making you so happy? <laughs> okay. This is a great start to this conversation. Yeah. You can sit there. Yeah, no we sitting. You guys had your hand raised? Yeah, go ahead. Amazing. You were going to say something too, Noor? Um, I'm like, I'm reflecting over that I um, realized that, you know, we will, eternity is based upon this short life. Um, so it just shows how, if you were to put it like an equation, it shows how valuable every single moment in this life. Has anybody engaged any of the other topics that Imam al-Haddad or just in the process of contemplation on anything, like making deliberate time for reflection to engage in that as an exercise, even if it's not with the regularity that he says as a part of your will, right? So in the fifth chapter, he's talking about the importance of having a regular will made up of recitation of the Quran, doing remembrance of Allah, etc. And then the chapters that come after, he's giving us now subtopics to having a wird, right? Recitation of the Quran, he says, on a daily basis. The acquisition of knowledge with regularity to be in a place where you do dhikr, remembrance of the divine with a regularity. But then reflection, he comes back and he says, again, this should be within a 24 hour time period that you're engaging in reflection in some capacity, right? So beyond the topics that he suggests, reflecting on the divine names, reflecting on the creation of Allah, reflecting on the hereafter, reflecting on the various things that he's made suggestions on, just reflection in general. Over the last month, has anybody seen in their routine a change? And if yes, like what, how has that been for you experientially? Just the act of making time to reflect. If you haven't done it, what's been getting in the way, you think? So let's do this, just to get people talking to each other. Because you're going to fit into one of the two categories. Either you did it, or you did not do it. It's not a problem if you didn't do it. But if you have been doing it, what's that been like, experientially? And if you have not, what's getting in the way? that's making it difficult to actually build into your routine moments upon which you are just reflecting and engaging in an active mode of reflection. Does that make sense? 
right? Which isn't just the same as I'm walking down the street and something interesting is in front of me, right? Like Khalid and I, at about 4.45, were on 21st Street and 1st Avenue. So my wife, who I'm deeply in love with, wanted us to carry a couch from 21st Street and 1st Avenue to 23rd Street and 3rd Avenue. And we did that in the street of Manhattan, walking with a couch in our arms. And all kinds of people were looking at us along the way. And they likely were thinking something. That what are these two men doing carrying this bright orange futon? It wasn't even a normal color. It was the color of an orange highlighter. Walking down the streets of Manhattan, looking the way we look with this thing. And they probably thought to themselves something. That's not deliberate reflection, right? That's an oddity comes in front of you and you can't do anything but take a pause to think, what is really going on here? We're talking about building into your structured routine moments of deliberate reflection and contemplation. Do you see the distinction between the two things? So just to get us kind of going, if you've engaged in it either because of the recommendation of the text or just a practice you engage in, what are some of the things that you're seeing through it? And if you haven't or you've tried but it's been difficult to, What's getting in the way? What's making it hard to actually create moments in your routine for deliberate fikr? To go through the deliberate process of reflection, contemplation, engaging in that type of spiritual exercise. If you can turn to the person next to you, just share your names uh, and let's discuss for a few minutes and then we'll come back and talk about it together. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so what are we talking about? For those who have been doing it, how has that been? For those who have not been, like what's getting in the way? What's keeping us from doing it? What did we discuss? Who'd like to start? Yeah, go ahead. Other thoughts? For those who've been doing it, how's it going? For those who haven't, what's getting in the way? Yeah. Can anyone else relate to that? Yeah? You don't want to talk? I just want to confirm that, yeah. Okay, great. Your affirmation is good. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And so all of these things are important to understand. What we did together was reflection, right? It doesn't have to be me alone doing that just with myself and my thoughts and where that's not a practice that I might be kind of benefiting from, right? We all will have different opportunities to understand ourselves in terms of what would yield the best kind of outcome through the medium or the avenue that allows for us to gain 
in this kind of process of reflection. But to go back to something that was said before, you don't want to be somebody who essentially doesn't connect how you act on what you know with what you know. You want to be in a place where you can understand that if there's a gain or benefit to it, and I'm not doing it, I have to come to a place of understanding as to why, and if the why that is keeping me from doing it is actually worth what it's costing me at the end. Do you know what I mean? And is that the only way for me to get what it is that I'm doing done that's preventing me from this? This has to be something that we keep going back to so that it's not just in the form of kind of fleeting thoughts, right? Why is this an important practice? Important enough that Imam al-Haddad is saying in a 24-hour period, you should have at least one hour, if not more, dedicated to this as a practice. Do you get what I mean? I mean, think about it even in terms of your relationship to religion, right? Hasna talks about Ramadan and how reflection becomes a key avenue to gaining, leading in and coming out of Ramadan. But how many Ramadans have any of you experienced that you can count the number of Ramadans you've gone to and you've heard the Quran recited again and again and again? Whether it's one night out of 30 nights or 30 nights in their entirety, you're experiencing a khatam of the Qur'an, you're leading the khatam of the Qur'an, you're engaged in the recitation of the Qur'an, versus how much of the Qur'an do you understand? It's not a knock on anybody, but just juxtapose the number of hours you have spent over the course of your life hearing it recited, whether that's on audio, YouTube, podcast, you go to pray behind somebody, you're praying yourself and reciting it, it's Ramadan, and it's just Quran from the beginning of the day to the end of the night, everything in between, or even just portions of it, what's missing is the reflection on the text, right? Tell me honestly. And you can even throw it back in my face and be like, we come to your center to pray. You don't do anything other than have people lead the tarawih prayer. But within the course of it, there's no one that's actively taking us through the contemplation of the Qur'an, right? The reflection of the Qur'an. Doing tadabbur on Qur'an. Do you know what I mean? And this is straight out of our tradition that just reflection an hour's worth of it in comparison to so much more of just engagement of ritual and practice the benefit comes in the reflection right so what is shaitan taking away from us is what makes us intrinsically human the ability to think to contemplate to reflect does that make sense if you take a bird's eye view in terms of what's just rotely memorized, what's regurgitated, what's experienced, but then not contemplated or reflected upon, and is a key ingredient to being able to just make sense, but to have growth and movement forward, because you can even reflect on the idea that why is my reflection yielding me what it is? How come I'm always the one that's right and everyone else is wrong? What's my reflection telling me about myself? How come I haven't made a mistake in so long or said sorry to somebody in a while? When was the last time I said thank you to someone? When was the last time I told someone I love them? When was the last time somebody told me they love me? Do you get what I mean? Right? But the ability to be able to draw from it requires that regular practice of reflection. And every single thing that we can say gets in the way, all of it can't be worth it to mute what is uniquely a gift given to you and I at a human level. That ability to contemplate, that ability to think. Why is this important? We've been talking about this chapter for three weeks, right? 
for those of you who come weekly, but the majority of us in the room do not still engage in this as a practice. Right? And you think about how many people you meet in the world on a daily basis, that when you see them, they just live in agitation. There's not balance. There's not contentment. It's not at any fault of everyone's themselves on their own. But these are some of the things that allow for the stillness to come in. And when you can understand that I need outward stillness as a mechanism to find inward stillness, then what's the cost if you're not deliberately finding those places of stillness or coming to regular gatherings or beyond the times that we deliberately have you talk to each other so that you actually connect at a level where when you leave from this place, you continue talking to each other, right? If the person you just turned to and had a conversation about the state of your heart was somebody that you listened to and verbalized to also, why can't you talk to them tomorrow about it as well? As opposed to waiting an entire week to just have a couple of hours where you engage in it in a sea of so much else where there's nobody really talking to you at the level of vulnerability that allows for you to be comfortable in reflecting in that way. You get what I'm saying? And even if you did it twice a week in some capacity, you did it a few times a week, right? An hour out of 24 hours ends up just being seven in a week that there's that many more that are not those things. But you're not going to get out of it other than what you put into it. And if you're not doing the exercise when you leave from here, then how can you get something from nothing? Right? Does that make sense? Does it? What, what do you think? What else gets in the way that we can start to address and confront so that we're able to bring presence and consciousness and awareness into it? Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Right? Because you can be mindful and allow for yourself to be comfortable when you're in a place where you have that inward sense of self. When Khalid and I, I don't know where he went, but when Khalid and I, there he is, we're carrying this couch down the street and it's hard, man. I'm 40 years old. I am definitely not in the shape that I should be in. We're carrying this thing and I'm a little person. My arms are not long and I'm holding this thing. And my partner in carrying this is the most flexible human being I've ever met in my life. And then at one point, we get about a block and a half away from this building. And my wife said, are you okay with me carrying it? I was like, yeah, I'm okay with you carrying it. You should have asked me before if you could have carried it. Why am I going to get uncomfortable? And why would that be something that would bother me? Right? One, I need to not be uncomfortable with somebody offering to help and me taking help. But two, I'm not going to walk down the street and somehow feign some sense of machismo that there's something wrong with me that my wife is now carrying this thing instead of me carrying it. She carried it a little bit and then she stopped and then I picked it up and carried it the rest of the way. But what allows for a control of the thoughts that doesn't make everything else pervasive, that'll just cause more difficulty where you don't need difficulty, is those stillness moments at other times in the week can allow stillness at a moment when you're exhausted and you're in a place where the thoughts can get the best of you and you still are in control of them. Does that make sense? So five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, the opportunity to cleanse your inward self of anything that bears toxicity. The Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, when he's with the Prophet wasallam, and the Prophet says, do you want to see a person of paradise? And they say, yes, we want to see this person of paradise. And someone walks by whose distinguishing factor is only as if they had made wudu recently on their way to prayer. It wasn't someone that was a known individual, a senior companion. This happened again and again, and Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he wants to know what's taking place that makes this person so unique. And so he comes to the companion's house 
and makes inquiry if he can come and stay in the home, saying that I can't be in my own home right now because of something going on there. The Sahaba honors the rights of guests and hospitality, and he allows for Abdullah radiallahu an to spend the day in his home. And there's nothing unique that happens. He says maybe what's taking place is at night. So he asks if he can spend the night. He's given permission to spend the night. And again, he doesn't see anything that is so unique that is taking place at night. And then the next day, he says to this man, Look, the Prophet said you are a person of paradise. What are you doing? Because he wants to do the same thing. And he says, I don't know why he would say that of me. And he implores them to think deeply. It's important to them. These were people that wanted to go to Jannah. May Allah make us all people of Jannah and put into our hearts a desire to be in Jannah. And so when he thinks about this for some time, he says that the one thing that I do every night before I go to bed is make sure that I clear my heart of any animosity towards any other person. You can't clear your heart of animosity if you're not reflecting on what's given a bode in your heart in the first place. And he didn't say that I do this once every three months or when somebody annoys me. On a regular basis, before he goes to bed, he is engaged in the process of reflection and he is removing the burden of bitterness and animosity anything that would create that toxicity in his heart letting go of the pain and the grudges and this is what yields for him this reality the prophet ﷺ says he's a person of paradise does the act in and of itself alone become the means maybe but also what it's doing now is informing how he chooses decisions outside of that because if he's removed it, it's not present through the vision of his heart in the way that he sees the world. So the reflection has now residual impact. It now informs other decisions and choices because there's an absence of something and the presence of something else. Do you get what I'm saying? And then that puts him on this pathway that it's not somebody conjecturing, but if the prophet says you are a person of paradise, then you are a person of paradise. Do you get what I mean? So you and I have to sit and think, why are we not getting it done? Five minutes, 10 minutes, recentering, reflection, contemplation, get a notebook, get a pencil, and just think actively in control of yourself. Find a buddy, tell them to come over. Hey, we hang out on Monday nights at Khalid's house. Why don't you and I go and hang out and talk? It's not meant to be like a pickup line, nor is it meant to be an excuse to be creepy with somebody. Be a brother and sister to someone and say, hey, like we can benefit still in this way where I can reflect to you, you can reflect to me. We can embody the hadith that says we are mirrors to one another. Literal reflection. Does that make sense? But if you don't do it, you are missing out on something. Do you see what I mean? And this is a text that is about the inward Right? This inward is going to inform what you take from what is outward, the ritual, the practice, the form. And how you make sense of everything else. And it's one of the most critical chapters. And if you can harness this as a regular practice, this is going to be a game changer in terms of how you make sense of everything around. So Imam al-Haddad, he starts this chapter by telling us that the ways of reflection are many. And he says, to begin with, the most noble of them is to reflect on the wonder of God's dazzling creation, the inward and outward signs of his ability, and the signs he has scattered abroad in the realm of the earth and the heavens. This kind of reflection increases your knowledge of the essence, attributes, and names of God. So here is step one of reflection. Who do you worship? And if you were not reflecting upon this through all of these different avenues, then you're going to stop your prayer just at praying as opposed to praying to God. 
Your fast is going to be just the act of fasting rather than fasting for the sake of God. Giving charity in the name of God, in the way of God. Honoring the rights of friends and family, building relationships with the pursuit of the pleasure of God. Obligations become burdensome as opposed to things that are empowering because it all goes back to God in this religion. So if you're not going to start with a reflection on who God is, then the rest of it is just going to fall in accord with where your starting points are. He says, reflect on the wondrous creatures that Allah has made and on yourself because you are a creation of the divine and think about just how magnificently you have been constructed and you have been made. I was saying this to a little kid the other day. I don't know why we were talking about this. But I said to them, maybe it was one of my kids, because my kids are mean to me, right? But I was talking about how when we gain weight, right, that most of that weight comes to like our midsection, you know? And I said, can you imagine what would have happened if when we gained weight, it went to like our hands? or to like your face only, or to like your legs. How would you walk down the street? The fact that you could carry it in your midsection is still a blessing from the divine because it allows for you proportionately to still move in different ways. But if it was only centered to one part of you that was at an extremity, just think about how difficult it would be Right? If all of the excess weight that I have on my body that I gained in COVID just lived in my right arm, I'd be dragging it down the street as I'd be walking, right? And so in my own overweightness, I can still reflect on truly how magnificent the divine is in the way that he has made me, that even in my negligence of my own physical wellness, Allah has built me in such a way that I still can exist and move forward. Do you get what I mean? He says, reflect on the favors of God and his bounties with which he caused to reach you. Reflect on Allah's complete awareness of you and his seeing and knowing all about you. And then he says what we talked about last time, know that you must reflect on this worldly life its numerous preoccupations, hazards, and the swiftness with which it perishes, and upon the hereafter and its felicity and permanence. And then reflect on the imminence of death and the regret and remorse which occur when it is too late. Now I want you to think about where we normally start in our religious journeys and understanding first what is obligatory practice, ritual, as opposed to learning how to celebrate the divine in our lives. The hadith says, right? That the hadith Qudsi, I am as my servant thinks I am. And here now embedded in this is a great opportunity as we segue into these last points of reflection. And Noor was saying this to me as we were having iftar, right? That a part of this reflection on death and the hereafter creates also an opportunity to reflect on your own meeting with the divine. And I had said to him that this is a hadith, right? That the Prophet wasallam he says, they saw in me farhatan, that for the fasting person, there are two farhas, two joys. Farhatun inda iftarihi, that there is a joy when he breaks his fast, and there's a, fa uh, there's a joy when he meets his Lord, right? May Allah make us those who are joyful when we meet our Lord. That first reflection point on who Allah is, is critical in understanding all of these subsequent reflection points, especially this reflection point on death as well as the hereafter people who are spiritual masters of our tradition, Rabi al-Basri, may Allah be pleased with her. She would say, I would not serve Allah like a laborer in expectation of my wages. It wasn't a transactional relationship. I wasn't doing so that I would get something in, done in return. I just did because I did, because that's what you do when you love. 
that the fear wasn't of Jahannam, nor was the hope in Jannah, but this was a recognition that these are simply also creations of Allah, and that desired not to live a life in pursuit of any of God's creation, I want to have a life that's simply in pursuit of the creator of all of these things. Do you see the nuanced difference that's there? You can't reflect fully on the reality of the hereafter, the reality of death, if you have not taken time to reflect on the creator of death in the first place, the creator of the hereafter in the first place. And it's just moments to engage in. So you don't go to different durus and halakat and conferences and YouTube videos and podcasts and they're just pastimes but you're drawing meaning from it that then says this will be a base of my philosophy on life is going to be where I stem my decisions and my choices from and it's a simple thing that everybody can do everybody has the capacity to reflect everybody does not have the capacity to speak Arabic as a language, it's hard for some of us. Everyone does not have the capacity to memorize the whole Quran. That's difficult for some of us. Everyone does not have the capacity to be a teacher of this or that. But that's not what we were all made to do. But all of us have the ability to contemplate. Just like each one of us has the ability to be distracted from contemplation. And you have to choose which one you want to be. And so those five or six are starting points. Start in that order. And then, as we start to end the chapter, he gives us a few more things to think about. Can someone read from the middle of the page? Know that you should reflect on those attributes and acts by which Allah has described his friends and his enemies. Somebody want to read from there? Page 33 in the PDF. You have it? Yeah, go ahead. Know that you should reflect on those attributes and acts by which God has described his friends and his enemies, and on the immediate and delayed rewards which he has prepared for each group. The righteous are in felicity. The deprived are in hell. Is the one who is a believer like the one who is corrupt? They are not equal. As for the one who gave, had taqwa, and believed in goodness, we shall ease him into, into ease. Up to the end of the surah, the believers are those who, when Allah is mentioned, their hearts tremble. Up to, they will have degrees with their Lord and forgiveness and generous provision. Allah has promised those among you who have believed and done good works that he will make them rulers over the earth as he had made those before them rulers. Each we took for their sin, on some we sent a hurricane, some were taken by the cry, some we caused the earth to swallow, and some we drowned. It was not for Allah to wrong them, but they wronged themselves. Hypocrite men and hypocrite women proceed one from another. They enjoin evil and forbid good. Up to Allah curses them, and there is a lasting torment. Believing men and believing women are helping friends to each other. They enjoin good and forbid evil. And good pleasure from and good pleasure from Allah which is greater, that is the supreme gain. Those who do not ex expect to meet us are content with the life of the world and feel secure therein. And and the end of their prayer is praise be God, the Lord of the worlds. The result of this kind of reflection is that you come to love the fortunate habituate yourself to uh, emulating their behavior and taking on their qualities and detest the wretched. 
and habituate yourself to avoid uh, to avoiding their behavior and traits of character. Okay, let's take a pause there. So here is now a reflection that he gives to us as a last description of reflection. That you turn to the Qur'an and you see the various descriptions that Allah has given of those who are close to him and those who are not close to him. If you read the Qur'an, there's various categories of individual that are identified as Allah loves and then the grouping of individual, right? Tawabin, mutatahirin, so on and so forth. It's always a description of a person. It's not a description of Allah loves, you know, this like other aspect of creation. It's always describing categorically a group of individuals rooted in a quality that is loved by the divine. There's various parts to the Quran that speak about individuals with the certain quality that then gets extrapolated at a deeper level. What does that look like, right? And now there's a definition of the muttaqeen, the people who have taqwa. Right? Till the end of the verse. It's giving descriptions of these people that are people that are close to Allah. Right? So you want to be a person of taqwa, then you read the verse. It's literally on the second page of the Mus'haf. This is what a person of consciousness looks like. This is what they do. This is what they believe. These are the acts that they embody. Right? You have listings in the Quran. Surah Al Furqan gives us a list that describes the Ibad al Rahman, the servants of the Most Merciful. So everyone and everything in creation is an Abd. Right? They are reliant upon something to exist. This is the definition of being an Abd. Allah uniquely is Al Ghani, self sufficient, not reliant on anything for his existence, Az Zawjal. You can nuance this now to fundamentally think about well, what am I an Abd of? And here is a description of those who are from the Ibad al Rahman. They're not only from the Ibad of Allah, but in particular, from this most beautiful divine name, Ar-Rahman, they are the servants of the most merciful. May Allah make us from amongst them. And if you read the verses that come after, there is descriptions of those who are the Ibad Ar-Rahman. Surah Al-Mu'minun gives a list again of qualities. Qad aflah al-Mu'minun. Indeed, the believers have succeeded. It's definitive. It's done. They definitely have succeeded. May Allah make us from the people of Iman. And then there's a listing of what their characteristics are. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Until the end of that set of verses. So what Imam al-Haddad is saying is, hey, you don't have to leave it to assumption, but the book is telling you these are those who are close to the divine. You want to be one who is close to Allah, then embody these characteristics yourself. Does that make sense? And all you have to do is reflect upon them, to understand them. This is Rabbi Sarna. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? And to recognize that for yourself. Is this going to be okay for people? Yeah? <laughs> is he good? His son shoots better? I can probably see his son being better than him. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you get what I mean? So the Quran as a text has to be understood also, firstly through these parameters, you got to ask yourself, do you believe that it's a book that actually has guidance to it? 
that it has something to instruct you. Not that it's something that you just memorize and read in your prayer, right? I said this at Juma on Friday. How many people were at Juma at the IC last Friday? Right? Great. So for those who were, as well as those who were not, as a reminder, quite often when you see Allah identified as Rabb in the Quran, usually it's within the context of also talking about our relationship to Him as He is our Rabb through a parameter of gaining guidance, Hidayah from Allah. Right? Rabbil Alameen, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim does not denote just point it out to us or show it to us. But the grammar there is giving an indication that, like, walk with us through it, kind of with gentleness. Right? The way my kids, you know, if you have young people in your life, my son, he and I, we walk and he holds my hand constantly. I love it. My daughter, she, when she's not feeling well, even like she <laughs> makes a point to tell me pretty much almost every day, Baba, I'm almost taller than you. Baba, I'm almost taller than you. And I'm like, baby girl, that is not an accomplishment, right? <laughs> you can get taller than a tall person, then congratulations. But when she's sad, she'll still come and I'll hold her and I'll carry her because she's still my baby, right? Ihdina sirat al mustaqim is you're turning to your Rabb. Rabb is not just Lord, but Rabb is al uh, Malik. It is Murabbi, Qayyim, Mun'im. All of these things are embodied in our understanding of Allah being our Rabb. You know, He's our caretaker, our provider. He is the owner of all things, the one that provides nurture in the context of being an owner. He is the giver of gifts and blessings to us. It's all within this word Rabb. And we say, sirat al mustaqim, that Hidayah that we're asking for is from that Rabb that loves us. And we're being asked or we're invoking with this regularity because you have a notion that it needs to be replenished. The same way you need water to be able to stay hydrated throughout your day, right? Hidayah has to also be something that gets replenished, that it has to kind of be asked for again and again, because it's not just one time you get it and then you're good, but you need to have it again and again, be filled up again and again. Does that make sense? And so the Quran is given in this way. Do you know what I mean? But you have to be willing to read it in that capacity. What I'd like you to do is just take a moment and now turn to the person next to you. As more people came in. Introduce yourselves if you don't know each other. How do you start to engage the Quran as a text in that way? Does the question make sense? Because a lot of us have memorized at least enough Quran to read in our prayers. Do you know? But that's not what the point of it is only. And it's not necessarily even the main part of it, right? It's a book that's conscious of itself. It's telling you what it is. It's meant to be a source of Hidayah. So what do I need to do to start reading it that way? How do I start to engage it in that capacity? Not so I'm just quoting it to be able to tell people, here's these verses, but I'm actually taking from it an understanding. Oh. Like if the verses say, this is what the Ibad rahman are like. They walk on the earth with dignity and grace. Why am I not then pondering and reflecting upon it in a way that I want to do that. Qad aflah al mu'minun. There's so many things that are in these verses. Walladina hum anil laghwi mu'ridun. They're the ones who avoid what is futile. Walladina hum ala salawatihim yuhafidun. They are the protectors of their salah. These are the ones who have succeeded. They're given falah. They're given jannah. 
why don't I read it in a way where I see it as kind of a guiding force that I then act upon it? Do you get what I mean? This kind of reflection is going to require us to engage the text and then actually take it in such a way where it's giving us guiding principles. And as you talk to each other, you want to then also just deliberate as best as you can in conversation. If I'm not taking guidance from the Quran, where am I taking it from? What's the basis through which I'm actually then choosing my choices? The standards through which I am making these decisions. Do you get what I mean? And a third point that I would interject there. What do you think the point is of the Quran if it's not a thing of guidance? Right? And that's not to say, let me hesitate to only say what's a profound answer. You and I have to be vulnerable enough or honest enough with ourselves to say, how do I perceive the purpose of this text? That if I'm not seeing it for what it tells me it is, it says it's a huda for the muttaqeen. It says it is shifa. It says it is a rahma. It says all of these things about itself. What do I think it is? What is it that I perceive it to be? Because that's going to be the biggest obstacle. Are you scared to read the book? What's making you scared? Is it something that only comes out in major life events and life experiences? Do you get what I mean? Right? Those few things, if you could turn to the persons next to you, let's talk for like five, seven, ten minutes about it, because it's an important thing. This is a book that was given as a last book for all of humanity. Shaitan is going to try to get us to not engage it for whatever reasons. So we want to think about what's getting in the way so we can start to take it as an instruction book, right? As a manual on how to be, not just to quote and parrot and kind of memorize without a point of engagement. So if you can turn to the persons next to you, let's talk about it for a bit and then we'll come back and discuss. Go ahead. So, what are some of the things we talked about in relation to the Quran? What are some of the things that came up in your discussions? Who wants to start? This is Kareem, by the way. Can you say something to him? Uh -huh. um, so what did we discuss? What is like your current perception of the Quran? Do you see it as a source of, of guidance? A source through which it's teaching you something, it has something to teach you, right? How do you know? Yeah. So how do we bridge that gap? Yeah. <laughs> That was profound. Mashallah. What are other things that kind of... Because this is a very important point, right? The Qur'an creates an ethical framework for you and I as we make decisions. But what if I don't know how to access that ethical framework? Right? It's not a linear text that here's the chapter 
that is on like employment issues. Here's a chapter when you have parents that are not nice to you, right? Here's a chapter on how to increase like your wealth. That's not how the text in and of itself is kind of broken down, right? The only chapter that follows the linearity that a lot of us are familiar with, if any, is the chapter uh, Surah Al-Yusuf. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's what a lot of us are accustomed to, right? But as you go through the text, there's topics that are now interjected in various kind of sections. It might seem like it's sporadic, um, and there's a lot going on there. Do, do you get what I mean? Right? Why is it important to understand that? Because every reason as to why you might not bridge that gap is not because you're a bad Muslim. Do you understand? Your default can't go to a place that gives shaitan victory over you, but you have to be able to objectively understand how to bridge this gap between ritual and instruction, right? Recitation and implementation. Do you get what I mean? And part of it is, like, nobody taught me how to read this book in a way where I can actually, like, know where to even turn to. And there's so much that's out there that are just platitudes or sound bites, right? Your heart is more important than a minute-long TikTok video. That's not to knock TikTok. There's a lot of gain that people have from social media, people who don't access local spaces, Quran, through the form of teachers. People have to take what they can, right? And this is a deen that there's not meant to be separation between the teachers and, for lack of better words, the laity. The Prophet ﷺ was so close to his companions that when people came to visit him for the first time, they couldn't tell the difference between who he was and the rest of the Sahaba. Because they're leading from within. It's a servant-based model of leadership that our religion is based off. If it's not a CEO structure that says, we all work so that this person gains, but it's a mode that says that we work in service of those that we serve. The leader serves the community, not vice versa. Does that make sense? Right? So there's a gap that I have to be vulnerable with myself. It's not honesty because you're not lying, but you have to be willing to acknowledge that I don't know how to actually engage this text, right? Like many of you have gone to college. Many of you have gone to grad school. When you went for your MBA, you went for your LSAT, you went for an MCAT, you went for any of these things. You're just learning how to take that test. If you go to a Princeton review, you go to whatever else that guarantees you X score, all they're teaching you is the way to engage the test, right? A friend of mine who's now a lawyer who could have gone to med school and did really well on an MCAT as well as an LSAT and became a, an instructor for all of these things, got to a point where in the training, they just taught him how to teach it, to give people the insight on how to approach this as an actual test. They're training to learn how to take the test. So he could take a GMAT, an LSAT, and get near perfect scores on all of it. Do you get what I mean? Because somebody taught him how to know how to work with the material in that way, right? You don't get that if all you're taught is like the instruction up to a level of 10 years old, 12 years old, that you have the faculties and capacity at that time to only go to that extent. I don't know where my son went, which, you know, it's fine, right? I got another kid, so if I lose one, it's okay. <laughs> but he's seven years old. He's not 17 or 27 or 70. 
But when he's 27, he has the intellectual capacity of a 27-year-old. But if he stops learning Islam when he's seven, or how to engage it, is only based at, inshallah, if he reaches 27, with what he took and then stopped for two decades. Starting and stopping at seven, it's not going to work, right? Right? So that's a gap that likely a lot of us have. It's scary to admit, but I don't know how to read the book that Allah gave to me. Not in terms of its language or its recitation, its pronunciation. I don't know where to go when I have a question that I know it has an answer, but no one's equipped me with the skills to know how to approach it. Do you get what I mean? Does that make sense? What are other things that come up? And we'll go back to troubleshoot some of this. We don't want to just land in a place where we identify the gap and then not figure out how do we engage it. But you got to first be comfortable and sitting within yourself to say, oh man, that's me. I am that person where when I'm trying to figure out, hey, like my parents, they don't treat me well. What part of the Qur'an helps me to navigate a toxic relationship? How do I read the Qur'an and it tells me how to deal with the loss of a loved one? A marriage that didn't work out. Not having a child in my life when I want one. How do I read it and it tells me how to be a good father to my son and to my daughter? To be a good husband to my wife? How do I read the Qur'an? My wife converted to Islam 25 years ago, maybe a little less, 23, 24. So my in-laws are all not Muslim. They're Hindu, which is very different from Islam. How do I read the Qur'an and the Hadith in a way that teaches me how to still be a son to my in-laws, who are now my mahram? How does a convert read those texts to be able to know how to relate to their direct non-Muslim family? Do you get what I'm saying? So I want you to sit with it. If that's you, it doesn't mean that you are going to stay there, but it can't come from a lack of trying, right? There has to be a process, a mode, to which we then say, like, hey, how do I become familiar with this, comfortable enough? That's why you can't be scared of the text. You have to see it as a source for what it actually tells you. Positive. It's a rahma. It's shifa. It's healing. It's mercy. Huda, guidance, right? In Arabic, one of the words for gift is hadia. It's got the same root. Why is guidance and the word gift derived etymologically from the same base? And just ponder upon that. And do I see it as that? Do you get what I mean? Does that make sense? What are other things that came up in our discussions? In relation to any of it on the Qur'an. Yeah. Yeah, Other thoughts? What else do we discuss in our groups? If anybody gets too warm, also, by the way, let us know. We turn the AC off for a bit because a couple of people are getting chilly. 
Um, but if it gets too hot or stuffy, we'll turn it back on. What else did we discuss? If it's not the Qur'an, maybe a different frame, where am I taking instruction from? Like, how do you know how to live? From you. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Why are you causing problems, Shalom? <laughs> you don't even live here anymore. No, how do you know? How do you know how to live? Right? You're a grown person. The youngest person in the room was my son, seven years old, right? How is Kareem going to learn how to live? What are the different things that will socialize him and influence his behavior? Yeah. When does that instruction stop? Or how does it come to you? Because the angel Jibrail and Wahi came to the Prophet over 23 years, starting from when he was 40 until he is 63. And the different modes of revelation did not come when he was 5 or 6 or 7. But he's a grown 40-year-old man learning Qur'an directly at the hands of his teacher, Gabriel, peace be upon him. Right? So the how to be in the world has to also be understood in conjunction with when was I exposed to that learning? Like, how are you taught how to treat people? And probably past kindergarten, Nobody said to you any more golden rules. Right? At some level, it just became unconscious. Look out for yourself before anybody else. The stereotypes, internalized racisms, socialization, like really being vulnerable, the people I'm surrounded with, the society around me, the institutions, the structures, the systems. And then, if you don't believe that the Qur'an is a rahmah, like, you gotta believe it. Rahmah is not just mercy. Rahmah has its own element of love, softness, gentleness, compassion, as well as mercy. In the midst of everything that wants you to not be consciously aware of why you are the way that you are, or to just root decision-making and choices based on what exactly. The Qur'an is given as actually a source of guidance. It's light, right? It's hadiyah, it's a gift. Think about an individual lost in an Arabian peninsula. Islam is interjected into these individuals, some of who are Bedouins, and where and how they literally are looking to the heavens for navigation and guidance. And somebody who's lost in the middle of this desert, not knowing where they are, suddenly gets the gift of guidance that sets them to their destination. They're not stuck in the middle of nothing and nowhere. How is that not a gift? Do you get what I mean? You don't even know that you're wandering around in pursuit of what? So if I'm not taking instruction from this, it doesn't mean I'm not taking instruction from someplace. Why? I'm not, it's not judgmental, right? A lot of you have known me in this room for a while. Some of you don't know me as well as the rest of you. You know, for those who have known me for a while, I love each of you. So I'm not saying it in that way. But if you don't stop and think sometimes about why do I dress the way that I dress? Why do I eat the way that I eat? Why do I put up with what I put up with from certain people, but not put up with it from other people in any way? 
Why do the things that make me angry make me angry and the things that make me sad make me sad? Why do I wake up at the time I wake up? Why do I go to bed at the time I go to bed? Why do I choose to pray these prayers but not those prayers? Why do I observe these days but not those days? I was taping a pilot for a TV show today with a friend of mine. His name is Simran Jeet Singh. <coughs> Yusra was in the pilot also. She's in the back. And Simran is a professor. He works in religion, interreligious studies. He identifies as sick. He's an amazing human being. In the Sikh community, you want to make special dua for because they constantly come to support Muslims and have literally been killed because people think they're Muslims. And again and again, they are asked, why don't you just say you're not Muslim? And they say, because that's not how we live. We don't throw people under the bus. But they know what their teachings are, right? You know what I mean? And so Simran asked me today, numerous meetings I had, there's a lot of food. I was fasting, it's Monday. And he was like, why do you fast on Monday? And I said, it's a sunnah to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. He teaches Islam. And he said to me that I've taught Islam for a long time. He's like, I've never met Muslims who fast on Mondays and Thursdays, but I've never also known that that's a recommended practice. And I was like, well, it is. <laughs> I don't know what to say, you know. But do you get what I mean in the context of this? Like, you have the access to the information, why is it not then something that is taken as instruction? And where are you getting your information from? He's a great guy, and I love him, but if he's your source of Islam, then he's your source of Islam, right? Versus just go to the source of Islam, which is the Qur'an. Where else am I taking my instruction from? Do you get what I mean? You got to ask the question. And then you have to ask, embedded in that was the other frame, what do I believe the text to be? Because it tells me very consciously of itself that it is a guidance, it is a mercy, it is a healing. But do I see it in these ways? Do I see it as a burden? Do I see it as something that's unfamiliar? Do I see it as something that is actually from Allah? Do you get what I mean? And this is a point that's very distinct from other religious traditions that are very comfortable in saying there is a human element to the current manifestation of their texts. Academically, religiously, they don't debate it. The Bible, people will tell you that men had a role in writing it in the version that we have today. There's entire rabbinic councils that play a role in informing what becomes now text that they derive their practice and ritual from. The Qur'an and the people who study Qur'an and the theology behind Qur'an in our tradition says it's unchanged. It exists in that same form. We learn how to even recite it in the ways that it was recited. That's crazy. But you got to think about whether I buy into it as a belief or not. What do you perceive it to be? How do you understand it in that way? Do you get the question? Did anybody actually talk about this in their groups? Yeah? What did you discuss? Like I know for me growing up, I was taught how to read the Arabic of the Qur'an. I had a Qur'an teacher that came to sit with me quite regularly, and that was great. I benefited a lot from her. She was an amazing person, mashallah. And you know, when you have teachers who really care about you, it just is very different, you know, because I do what I do now for a living. And there's a lot of people that I meet who, whether they're Muslim or not, and you made a different age in my life, a lot of them are very kind. Some of them were not nice to me. 
and they'll like see me now in spaces and be like, oh yeah, I remember he was a student of mine. I was like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> this one woman who I read Quran with uh, at a very difficult phase in my life because I was reading it a lot when I was younger. I was very close to my grandparents. And from a young age, my grandparents all started to pass away and it had a deep impact on me. And I, for some time, had a series of losses in my life that made it difficult to maintain that continuity. And then when I was kind of in a latter stage in my preteens, I had a teacher who was very nice, and she was an old South Asian woman that would come to read with me. And I saw her like much later in my life. She was much older now, and uh, I was probably in my late 30s at that point. And I hadn't seen her for like decades. And she came and she uh, knew that I was going to be someplace. And she asked me if I remembered her. And I said, of course I remember you. And she, she gave me as a gift a mushaf. And she said, I'm so proud of you and what you do. And I can tell you it's moments like that when you can actually feel the presence of like somebody who taught you something but they love you. It makes it so different, you know? The kind of energy that comes is incredible. But being in that place where I was interacting with her, she didn't make it seem like I wasn't entitled to relate to the Quran. I was still like a young person, but I wasn't in a place where I felt as if I was somebody who shouldn't be allowed to read this book. Do you get what I mean? And I didn't even know how much that helped me until I was much older and I started to read it a little bit differently. Because when I'm 12, when I'm 11, I'm still reading it based off of the terms that, as was said, those who are older are giving to you what it was that they possessed in the first place. So this is how you read it. You learn it's Arabic and you just read it and that's it. When I was older, it wasn't hard, right? I would sit in gatherings with scholars when I was younger and I would go whenever there was a sheikh before I started to build a relationship with a sheikh in particular that I was studying different things with. I was just going and anybody that was teaching, I would just sit and ask them questions. I have notebooks filled with all kinds of stuff and was always in the front row, but once the talk was done, I would just keep asking things. And as I got older, I realized that because people like that woman who taught me Quran, that didn't make it seem like it was wrong for me to read this, that it was actually a blessing and a gift, allowed for me to feel equipped in my socialization to do things that I didn't see other Muslim people doing, that they feigned this deference that said, you can't be asking people these questions, right? These are the shayukh. And I'm like, well, they're the ones that know the things. What am I supposed to do, right? And then it opened up broader perspectives of like even where there's a sense of just accessibility for men that's not there for women. And why in our community, we don't want to build things in that way. That if you even take advantage of what you have access to, it's usually male individuals asking questions of male scholars, and women are kind of stuck in a different part of the masjid if there's even a space for them. And they're not able to talk to anybody. That's a problem, right? And all of these things factor into then our relationship with Quran. Do you get what I mean? You don't have to verbalize it here, but you have to ask yourself openly, do I see this for what it intends itself to be? Or do I see it as something else? And what do I have to do to pivot to actually see it as a source of healing, a source of guidance? Sheikh Hamza has a great podcast that he used to do called Sacred Messages or Sacred Text Messages or something like this. But in one of them, he talks about the Quran being Shifa. And he says, aside from the hadith that we have, where companions use this as a mechanism for like spiritual healing and physical healing of ailments, 
He said it also contributes just to your physical wellness and robustness. If you're reading it with regularity, it actually is a source of just proactive good for you, like physical health in a good way, right? I don't remember the name of that podcast. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Did Oscillation you hear? Of the heart. Huh? It was called Ostentation of the Heart. Yeah, great. Ostentation of the Heart. Go listen to it. It's really incredible. And he talks about it in this way. But listen to it in the prism of this. Do I believe in this in this way? Because when I was 18, 19, and I started to read the Quran now, asking questions and willing to like think about it in terms of what is it giving to me and what am I actually taking from it? When I was reading like the story of the Prophet Ibrahim, I'm reading like hadith of the Prophet and everything is saying to me, man, you do not believe in the God that these people believe in. They believe in a God that gives them strength and energy and courage, that makes them bold and audacious, comfortable enough to live on their own terms. A lot of us are not kind and compassionate to the extent that we could be. I would argue in large part because we're not comfortable with who Allah is to us. The Prophet knew who Allah was to him and he smiled at everybody. Greeted young and old, people of his own community and people of other walks of life. He could have good character through his understanding of who Allah is. Everything goes back to God in our religion. You see what I mean? And one of the greatest openings that I could tell you was my willingness to admit that I don't believe actually in the God that this book is teaching us about. The God that I've been made to believe in has me walking on eggshells. They're not walking on eggshells. Where's the disconnect? Do you get what I'm saying? And it's critical as you go into these parts of reflection now, right? where Imam al-Haddad is saying, you should reflect on those attributes and acts by which Allah has described his friends and his enemies and on the immediate and delayed rewards which he has prepared for each group. Why? Because you want to adopt the characteristics that the Quran says are good. Why? Because that's what Allah has deemed to be good. This religion is not rooted in a moral relativism. It understands that the creator of all creation is the only one that can undeniably define what it means to be good. There might be situational ethics that we kind of go through here and there, but the Quran is going to be able to tell you, hey, these are the things. And what does it tell you? If you've ever read the Quran, just in terms of it being a book on character, it's telling you not to gossip, don't backbite, to uphold your promises, to be honest, to take care of orphans and widows and the elderly, right? to remember those that the world has forgotten. It's really remarkable in terms of just looking at it from the standpoint of Quranic kind of character. Do you get what I mean? But you have to buy into it first and see it in that way to then say, hey, this is how we're equipped, we're wired. I work with college students. Some of you are college students right now. Some of you went to college. Why did you do all of the things that you did? This is the trajectory to becoming a doctor. This is the trajectory to becoming a lawyer. This is the trajectory to becoming an academic, an artist, an activist. There's nothing wrong with becoming any of these things. But principally, there's a structure that you bought into. Internships, co-curriculars, clubs, whatever else I need to do to be able to get to that destination. That's what these things are. And you take advice from people, you take insight from courses, you read books, you listen to TED Talks. The Qur'an is giving you a set of instructions to be able to teach you how to be the way that Allah intended for you to be while you exist in this world. It's got to be subjectively important 
to me in order for me to then take it in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. I want you to do for two minutes, just turn to the person next to you. What are you taking away from this so far? What are some of the things that are kind of rising up from it? And then we'll come back and discuss. Go ahead. Okay. So what are some of the things we're taking away so far from today? What are we discussing? What is it bringing up for you? What is it making you think about? Who wants to start? Yeah. Um, I found that uh, throughout life, uh, we tend to I, I tend to interact with different surahs of the Quran through experience. Um, and uh, one thing this gathering has reminded me of is that you know, there's so many there's a tafsir book I've been reading. You know, I should go back and continue to finish it and be more conscious on. Acquiring more knowledge uh, in regards to the meaning of the Quran. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. I think uh, I realized one thing that you kind of said is that my education uh, honestly did stop kind of like where you mentioned when I was like 12 years old, and then maybe I reset it a little bit as I got older. Um, but not necessarily like I, there was a gap, you know, I had a 12 year old mindset in terms of like Islam for a long time, and then I had a different mindset. Um, and I think like during that time of gap, um, there are other influences that have kind of shaped how I started you know, uh, thinking about like where I derive my morals from, where I derive my ideas from. And sometimes I find it hard to. Uh, um, when I find myself in situations, those other um, institutions and uh, morals that I derive from different areas might like take over in a certain situation rather than what could have taken over if I had been a little bit more consistent. Uh, so I might try to like find my own little takeaway and try to make sure that there aren't there aren't gaps uh, in time gaps in time periods where where I, um, I let other other ideas and thoughts kind of like take over to create a special situation for me to stay alive. Amazing. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Other thoughts? Takeaways? Or anything that's kind of coming up for people if you're thinking about some of this stuff? You can also say what someone else said to you, and then just or pretend like someone said something, and it's really what you want to say. <laughs> and then, based off of people's reactions, you could be like, "Oh, just kidding, that was me." Yeah. And you think about these kind of in unison, right? Not as separate topics. So before reflection, Imam al-Haddad talks about dhikr, right? Remembrance. Before this, he talks about ilm, the acquisition of knowledge. Before that, he talks about recitation of Qur'an. These are four subsets to having a daily wird for yourself, you know? And different kind of time frames for each of them. 
daily recitation of Quran, daily reflection, but regular acquisition of knowledge, right? Regular periods of adhqar. Do you see what I mean? It's all like rooted in something that's, that's structured. You just got to try your best fundamentally, do you know? But there's a difference between trying our best versus not fundamentally doing anything at all, you know? You don't want to fall into the ladder. Why? Like, what's the end result of this? It's contentment. It's a satisfaction of the heart that escapes people, not because it's a difficult journey, but we're chasing after other things. It's not to fall into this different mode of seeking validation from Allah's creation. So it's not that you walk in here next week and you're like, hey man, I reflected for 12 hours this past week. And everyone's like, oh, that's so amazing. Nobody's going to think that's like a cool thing, right? But you have to understand the purpose behind it and what the yield is in order for yourself to then incentivize. The same way you killed yourself pursuing the degree that you pursue. The same way you gave up late hours of the night in chasing after what exactly? It's not that that's a bad thing, but you know what the end kind of result is that necessitates that mode of exertion. You have to be able to apply it here as well. And what a consequence is of these different types of reflections, Imam al-Haddad mentions at each like section of the paragraph that this fills your heart with this, this allows for you to be filled with this. But the overarching yield is going to be a sense of inward balance, right? That allows for sadness to still be experienced, but what the sadness does to you is different. It allows for anxieties to still kick in, but the overwhelmingness of the anxiety is different when there's inward balance and contentment. It's not the only way to get there. There's other things that have to come up. And you address, like, with vulnerability, like, hey, this is what creates this obstacle for me. This creates this kind of stopgap for me. These are things that are getting in the way that allow for me to still reach what it is that I am fully entitled to. Just a sense of self that allows for me to be grounded, that allows for me to find joy in like whatever it is, beauty in the little things around me, meaning that is definitively there. And then I don't have to spend my best years of my life pursuing what a consumer-driven society wants me to believe is a source of happiness, but really is just me emptying my pockets on things that beyond the novelty of experience, I don't really have satiation from it after a short period of time, right? Some of my kids do, you know? My kids are some of my best spiritual teachers, mashallah. But you just see like how they also live. You know, we got like things that people give to us that they don't touch. I don't know if you ever do this or not and people in your family or your roommates, but there's times my kids will see something that they haven't touched for years, like literally years. And they'll see it in a bag that's going to like Salvation Army, that's going to kids in the hospital, something that's in the garbage. And they see it and they're like, I can't believe that that's in there. What is wrong? Why would you do that? I, I'm like, what is wrong? You, got, like, you have not touched this thing in the last three, four years of your life, you know? What is it that is really eliciting this response in this moment? And we don't function any differently. Do you get what I mean? Like you have something, you play with it for a little while, and then you go buy a new toy. Because the happiness that it claimed to give to you, it actually didn't give it to you. But rather than saying, maybe this isn't where happiness comes from, it's maybe I'm not buying enough things. Maybe I need more things. Right? You give the children of Adam a mountain of gold, then they go and seek out another mountain of gold. You can think about this in terms of greed, or you could also think about it in terms of just misconstruing the point that says, man, the mountain of gold didn't make me happy. I probably just need more gold. That's the problem. So I got to go get more gold now. No, that's not like where contentment comes from. And it's this kind of self-perpetuating thing where the reflection 
yields the insight that creates the contentment that then spurs more reflection and allows for us to see things differently. Does that make sense? So between this week and next week, if you take some time to engage the Qur'an in this way, go home, open it up, it's translation, you know, transliteration, read the Arabic, hear its recitation. If you can't recite it yourself, listen to it across whatever platforms, websites. Everybody has to start someplace, you know? If you don't have a favorite Qur'an reciter, that doesn't mean you're a bad Muslim. If you don't have the ability to read the Arabic or read it yet, it also doesn't mean you're a bad Muslim. When the Prophet sent his companions to the Persians, the Byzantines, the Romans, do you think all those people spoke Arabic? Every single one of them? When they're talking about Surah Al-Maryam in the court of the Najashi, and Jafar ibn Abi Talib is reciting these verses as the Mushrikeen of Mecca have chased after them to persecute them further. You think everybody who's crying in the court of the Abyssinian king, the Najashi, what is modern day Ethiopia, all of them spoke Arabic in the way that the Quraysh spoke Arabic? No. So you don't have to have these kind of misconceptions of like, this is the only way or the best way, quote unquote. You start somewhere and you kind of go. But spend some time with the Qur'an tonight while some of these thoughts are in your head. Spend some time with it over the course of the next few days. And just think, what is truly my relationship to it? It's told me what it is, but who am I now in relation to it? How do I see it in terms of my perceptions versus what it actually is meant to be? And you just start reading it and engaging it. You have questions? Amazing. Curiosity is so important. And as adults, we lose sight of just how miraculous things are around us. Everything is so exciting to a child. When you're an adult, everything is so exhausting. And you lose the inquisitive nature that reflection also allows for us to have, to be able to take from so much that's around us. So you get a question, you don't have to know the answer to everything. That's the whole point of all of this. Allah is al-alim. You are not. Allah is the one that knows all of it. You don't know all of it. Just write your question down. If you find somebody you can ask the question of, then great. If you don't, we'll help you find the people that you can talk to about those things. But it's not meant to be an obstacle. It's meant to be an opportunity for more growth. So engage in that relationship on these verses in particular that Imam al-Haddad is saying, reflect on who Allah has told you are the people who are closer to him and the ones who are further away, right? Allah is described as being qareeb to us in the Qur'an. He's not described as being ba'id at a distance. So when there's distance between you and Allah, Allah is qareeb. So what creates the distance? That's why you don't want to think about good and bad in these ways, but think about it in terms of how it manifests itself. If I adopt the characteristics that distance me from the divine, then they're going to distance me from the divine. So if it's hard for me to feel connected to the divine or feel the presence of the divine, maybe I should stop lying so much. Maybe I should stop speaking poorly about people when they're not there or even when they are there, which is much worse. If I want to start to remove some of the veils, maybe I should be engaged in acts of volunteerism and charity. We break fast together on Mondays here. Maybe I should invite people to break fast with me on Thursdays in my house. Right? Create opportunities for company so that people are not only with other Muslims once a week or twice a week. Do you get what I'm saying? So we want to deliberately engage on some of that and then if you haven't already try in your head right now just 10 minutes and in your head right now a space that you can go to and even in your head right now think about the people that will be there with you that'll help you keep focused 
Because reflection in our tradition and solitude in our tradition is not about being away from people. It's about being away from distractions. So between this Monday and next Monday, where, with who, and for how long are you going to engage in a deliberate process of reflection? Not rumination, not self-deprecation, not my thoughts are running all over the place, but with who, for how long, and where will I carve out 10 minutes to just engage in reflection of some kind? If you can't find 10 minutes for it, you are lying to yourself that you don't have the time for it. What you're really saying, it's not important to me. And then what are you, to its logical conclusion, saying is not important? Just the centeredness of my heart, the ability to make sense of what quite often feels like a senseless world, irreconciled emotions, experiences, feelings, all kinds of things. That reflective mode can be helpful. We hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, donate to help support us at icnyu.org, and most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.